want to speak tonight on the day of surprises. A lot of respect and honor to you and, and uh, your love you showed for the Lord. Uh, we'll go to his word tonight, but we're not going to give you the full message. So um, I want to talk about some surprises. I'm going to list them in brevity, and I'm going to come back and only preach one point. I want to bring one message to you. As you think about the days of the Lord, of uh, that day of his arrest and trial and all that he went through, I find that there was some things that were very surprising. First of all, were my first thought, and we'll come back and visit this. First of all, I think... What surprised me was the experience of Simon, the Cyrenian. He was a Jew. He was probably a black man. Uh, we're talking to one of our missionaries now that's working in Africa with one of the great large Jewish black communities that had been found in that, in that region of the world. But I think, and we'll visit this, talk, this thought, but the experience of Simon, I think that was a surprise. I think the woman, the women there that would travel with the Savior, I think... I was surprised about what he did with them. And there would be almost some ladies that would just lament and uh, mourn and follow the crucifixion trail as these men, these people would be crucified. And so it was in that day, these women. And a few of the times that the Lord stops and talks, he turns to them and addresses them. As they're trying to console him, we find that similarly, literally that he turns around and consoles them and tells them that needing to be very careful and weep for themselves. And so it's very interesting to see, and that's a surprise to me that the Lord would do that. And uh, it's very interesting. Um, they, would, they would follow these criminals because of, you understand that when a person wanted to be crucified, the Roman soldiers traditionally would hang a placard about their neck and it would have the crime on that they committed in the reason they were being executed. But do you think about the placard that the Lord had upon his, uh, his neck? He had no sin that he'd ever done. But if he'd have a placard, it'd be the fact that, my friend, he was just guilty of, of loving us as sinners and that he was dying in our, in our place. I think, number three, I was surprised as I read this story in the setting, the surprise about the executioners. When they come to request the body of the Lord, the centurion went back in his final inspection and found that he was dead and they were surprised and he declared certainly he was the son of God. Remember that story? Certainly he was the son of God. As I read this story, this chapter 23, I find another thing that surprised me was the darkness. The darkness from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. That is when all the circumstances around, if you please, the crucifixion, rather whatever end it might be, was not nothing like from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, three hours of darkness. Amos, the Old Testament, prophesied about it. He said, I will cause the sun to go down at noon and I will darken the earth as, it, as on a clear day. And, you know, there was a darkness like never was before and that was simply because of what the Lord was doing for us on the cross for our sin. And then I think I was surprised as I read the story of the temple. Now, you understand the temple. The temple was built with different courtyards in it. And they'd use them, they would call them courts. And there was the outer court that would be welcoming to anybody. There were some other courts as you'd move closer to the Holy of Holies where only men were involved and invited, places where only the Jews would be involved. And then of course the inner circle, the inner core, if you please, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, that literally they believed that the presence of God was there, that nobody would be able to permit to go into that inner court of the, where the mercy seat was held except for one time of the year, and that was a priest. And historically, traditionally at times, the Jews would literally tie a rope around the ankle of the priest that go in after he had cleansed himself and then go and make an offering for the people the Day of Atonement one time a year because they thought that if he would die, they could get him out because nobody would want to go in there because that was in the very presence of God. And one of the surprises of the story is literally that my friend immediately when Jesus declared that it was finished, my friend, there was a commotion in the inner court. There was a commotion, my friend, in the Holy of Holies, the place of God's shadow and God's presence. They said it was at that very moment that my friend, that the the veil of the, of the tabernacle was rent. And it was 60 foot long, it was 30 foot high, and it was rent 
as never before. If you and I would try to rip a material that's almost six inches thick, we would start at the bottom of it and rip it up, but it was rent, rent the Bible said, from the top down. That's amazing. God said, anybody can come to me now. Amen. You don't need a priest. You don't need a priest. You've got a Savior. And then I think one of the other surprises of my message tonight in this story, it's all found in, I've prepared it, and I'm going to pass it all by and just simply say that in this story, I find one of the surprises to me was the story of salvation. And the thief on the cross gets saved, and what, what fascinates me is he was an extreme sinner, amen? He was an extreme sinner, amen? He was extremely close to eternally, eternity, and salvation become extremely clear, amen? It put it all together. It made so much sense, my friend, as it, as it was unfolded. So I think there's some prizes there, and I'm not going to develop them. Uh, allow me to honor the Lord and respect you tonight and, and love our Lord at the same time. And only go to one point, and I go to chapter 23 and verse 26. And it's in this place that we find the story of Simon the Cyrenian. And I read in verse 26, and as they led Jesus, as they led Jesus away, him away, they lo laid hold on Simon a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and of him they laid the cross that he might bear it, after Jesus. Crucifixion was not a strange or an unfamiliar sight to the people of Jerusalem. Do you have any guess? Up until the time of Christ, up until the time of the Lord was crucified, how many, how many people that the Romans and their cruel brutality, my friend, to put the fear in the people because of the rule, how many were crucified just in Jerusalem alone? Historians tell us, my friend, that there was at least 30,000 people that were crucified coming up to that place in time where Jesus himself would be crucified. Now think with me just a little bit about Simon and we'll make our way to my one single thought. He was a Cyrenian, as the scripture so very care carefully says, but that Cyrenian was a city, if you please, a region, my friend, in North Africa. And so Simon, my friend, and this large Jewish community had a heart for the Passover. And so it was a dream and it was a heartbeat of any Jew that had any at all planted in their heart to one day visit Jerusalem and observe with his own eyes, with his own hands, the Passover. They said for a man to travel on that day from North Africa to the Jerusalem, it literally would take years and years to save the monies to get him, to be able to get him just to get there. So here's a dream of a heart. Here's a representative of a family. Here's a man that leaves a community with the purpose of going to a place, to observing the Lord's Supper, to observing the Passover, if you please, and coming back and carrying it back to his people. And the Bible said he was coming out of the country, so I'd have to assume that Simon has just arrived in Jerusalem. He's just got there. The scripture says, you know, that he was coming out of the country. And so as he just arrived, we're not certain about all of that, but I could see that very clearly and very plainly and easy to understand that here he comes, he's coming in, my friend, into Jerusalem for the very first time. And wouldn't you know it, when he gets there, he's crossed by a multitude of people. And these Roman guards have three different criminals they're going to crucify. In the middle of that, there's one and his name is Jesus, amen? There might have been 30,000 before, but there's only one Savior, right? There's only one like unto the Son of God. And the Bible makes it very clear, my friend, that without question, my friend, that God was going to do something with that Simon the Cyrenian. You know, I can imagine stumbling onto that scene and then all of a sudden, understand with me that the Lord had been very tired. Do you understand? Um, the disciples couldn't stay awake as he asked them to pray, as you remember the story. But not only was he busy and tired from the day, but now it's now spent into the night when he was arrested. He was sentenced early in the morning. And now, my friend, he's beaten within an inch of his life. And now he's carrying this cross that could have weighed as much as 300 pounds. And now he falls beneath the load. There was a Roman law that they put in place. It was very interesting. It was called the, the law of conscription. 
Uh, Brother Kenny, come and help me. Won't you come here for just a second? And the tradition was and the culture was that this law of conscription was simply that if the Roman soldier at any time would take his spear and the flat of the spear, if Kenny was, if Kenny was Simon the Cyrene, if I was a Roman soldier, then I would place this upon his soldier and then he immediately, this man would become, my friend, a servant to the Roman government. And so it was when Jesus fell beneath the load, they began to look and that Roman soldier took his spear and the flat put on his shoulder, indicating that he now was a servant, my friend, to the Roman government. Very interesting, isn't it? Thank you, Brother Kenny. Appreciate that. It's very interesting. It's very fascinating to me. It's a surprising. Because as you follow Simon along, all of a sudden you find that this accidental, this surprise, from North Africa all the way to Jerusalem, now all of a sudden this Roman soldier places this flat of his spear upon his shoulders and now all of a sudden he now has become a servant of the government, the Roman government. And so now, behind him, staggering perhaps the Savior, we don't know that anyone gave him any assistance, but now he follows his own cross in which he would die on, and Simon carries it forward. He takes it to the place where they would be crucified. Now, it's very interesting. We find the story. It was very amazing. It was amazing because of what happened to his life because of it. I think we, as people, use the word luck. I don't, I don't really like the word luck. I, I, think, there's, um, I think there's odds, um, you know, um, but I don't know, about, I don't know if I like the word luck. I know in the, in the life of the Christian, the Bible in Romans 8, and we know that all things, good, bad, sweet and sour, easy or hard, all things work together for what, church? To those that love God, to those who are called according to their purpose, to his purpose. There's no, no question about it, my friend, that God has a plan, that he'll use everything that comes to you and me in my life, in our lives, because we love God, he's going to use it for good. He doesn't say that to the unsaved. He does not even say it, my friend, to a Christian out of God's will. We'd like to twist that, and sometimes we might want to preach that, but that's not exactly so. Because it doesn't say that. It talk, talks about those that are called according to his purpose, that are in the will and, in, and have the heart of God within them. But I'm telling you what, the sovereignty of God and the work, in God and our, work of God in our lives is, is much greater than we even ever think about. And I believe, I believe when that soldier looking at that crowd of people about them, looking for someone to carry the saviors, cross the rest of the way, I don't believe it was an accident, my friend, that he put that on Simon's shoulders. I don't believe that. I believe that, my friend, that God was at work in Simon's life as he's working your life and my life. And you know, we sometimes don't really believe how much God is at work in our lives. I don't think we realize it. I don't think we see that. I said that statement this morning. It actually was supposed to be in this message. But I talked about the blind people. And everything is there. The blind people just can't see it. And everything's in our lives, and sometimes we just don't see it. We just don't see it there. Now, let me tell you what happened to Simon's life. Can I tell you about Simon now? Can I tell you about this incidental touch from the Savior? Can I tell you about this out of chance traveling all that way from, from, from North Africa all the way to Jerusalem and just so happened to get there to one time and one time in only one time in all eternal history, and he is stopped, my friend, by a mob of people that are crucifying Jesus. I don't think it was an accident. I think it was on purpose. You know, the Gospels, every one of the Gospels talk about this Simon the Cyrene. Now listen to this, and watch as I begin to make my message. They talk about Simon the Cyrene after, after he'd been a servant to the Lord, and carried the cross of the Savior. In the scripture it says in Romans 16 and verse 13, it says that Rufus, the son of a woman who became a mother to Paul, here's what Paul said, salute Rufus, chosen the Lord, his mother and I. So here you, here you see it. You got a man by the name of Simon, Simon 
the, excuse me, the Cyrenian. And we find, my friend, that this man now took the message that he had seen and he had heard and he had felt, and he took it to his wife and she was saved. Talks in the scripture about his two sons. Remember Alexandria and Rufus? And the father, Simon, that's who it was. Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. It was interesting, my friend, that yes, it was an opportunity. Yes, it was a, a chance, was it? It was, a, it was an accident, or really was it the hand of God that opened up doors for him in such a way, my friend, that he could go through and he'd never be the same after it. His consecration, my friend, carried him, my friend, the rest of his life. And that event, my friend, that some would look all over as chance and odds, my friend, it was not at all. And it was, a, it was an amazing encounter, my friend, with the Lord's will and opening the door for his life. It was very interesting that when Simon the Cyrenian come to that place and, and God seen that he would be the one, that from that time on his life was never the same and his life was forever different. You think about the people you met, and I met. You think about the jobs you were at. One of the visitors here this morning said, I met one of our, your church members. I met him in Taco Bell in the line. And one of our church members said, you are in my church today. You are in my church today. You say, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm telling you that I believe that we need to look at, my friend, every event and every happening in our lives as an intervention of God opening a door for us to go through. And if we fail to go through those doors, my friend, that are open to us, that God talks to us about, that God in, in supernatural ways arranges in our lives, my friend, I don't think there's an accident. I think there's open doors and we must be careful to step up and to be able to recognize that that might be God, that that might be his plan. And Simon the Cyrenian, his life was never the, never the same. And he was a great, powerful Christian believer that affected his children and affected his, his wife had become a part, my friend, of every one of the gospel stories. It was because, my friend, he took the opportunity that God gave him and did something with it. Um, it was disguised as almost a shameful thing. It was disguised almost as a thing that would be, be looked down upon. But my friend, it was an event in his life that God was moving with and God was going to work with. And this evening, I think you and I need to become very conscious because your name is Simon with this message. Your name is Simon the Cyrene and you've traveled a long way in the journey of life. And if you're not careful, you'll think that my friend, you're in the pursuit of God and trying to find him and want to find the Passover. But in the real actuality of life, he's in the pursuit of you and he's looking for you. And he's waiting, you, waiting for you to take that step and make that journey and put your life in order and come to that place where you can be ready and seeking him. And when you're there, my friend, he'll reach down and he'll touch and he'll take you. I was compelled this morning to pray with one of our little guys. You know, we've got some great young people in this church. You know that. They sleep in your beds. You know, they're in your home. They're your babies. But I was impressed, you know, to talk, to pray with one of our, one or not a real big guy, you know. He's not 18 yet. He will be. I was impressed. And you know what? I'm convinced that many a times that God does that in our hearts and our lives. So because my friend, we're at, we're at moments of intersections in people's lives and we must step up and step into those places because my friend, after they go through those doors and after they walk past those places, my friend, it's amazing what's on the other side of them doors. I'm saying that God's got intersections for you and he's got them for me. And, and God is going to have somebody else, not a Roman. The Romans would take the longest route possible to the place, my friend, they were convicted and condemned. To the place, my friend, where they're to be crucified because they wanted to show their brutality. And can I say that I believe that the God of heaven, my friend, would take and place upon your shoulder and my shoulder different things to do in places and doors that are opened. And he'll do that because it's the open door that leads, my friend, to a new life and a new walk that will never, ever, ever be the same. It was interesting what God asked Moses. What is that in your hand, Moses? He said, man, it's my shepherd's stick. It's my rod. I've been, 
I've been in the field. I've been caring for the sheep with it. That's what it is. What is it? He said, it's my rod, Lord. He said, now throw it down, Moses. And you remember the story. He threw it down and it was transformed into a snake. And never after that instant was it ever called the rod of Moses. Forever was called the rod of God because it was surrendered. Because Moses stepped up and stepped through that door. And God used him in big ways after that. Two things and I'd be dumb. Number one, what door has God opened up for you that you need to step through? What door? You say, well, it's just a job. No, it's not. It's just a schoolroom. No, no, it's not. No, no, it's not. Uh -uh. It's just a new neighbor. No, it's not. <laughs> I met him at the restaurant. No, it's not. Say, he, he, they took my money. I said to a lady the other day, I said, ma'am, can you please help me? I've got a real big question. She said, sir, yes, what can I do for you? I said, ma'am, my life, I've given almost all my money, I give it to a woman. Can you tell me why I always have to give my money to a woman, can you? And she just chuckled. Then I pulled a track from my pocket and, and told her of the Lord. I, there's not such a thing, my friend, as an accident. There's, there's, there's designs of God that God takes us to those doors that we will never, ever, ever see. It was the spring of the year, probably, I don't know, mine, mine goes so, so quick. I was hunting down my way and I heard a strange call, a turkey call, a strange call. And I said, anybody who calls that bad, I got to at least try to find him because we were hunting on that same farm together. And I waited for a while and walked up to a guy and stuck my hand out. And I said, was that you calling up there? And he said, yeah. I said, man, that's, that's some real calls you're making, you know. Real calls you're making. I said, hey, I'm, I'm your neighbor. And uh, I'm not only your neighbor, but I'm a Christian. I just want to ask you. I want to ask you a question about the Lord. Come into church service one time and there was balloons set up. There was one balloon that was way up on the hill and the other balloon way down the hill. And for some reason I drove around the church trying to figure it out and there was another balloon and I realized then that somebody had marked something off. And they were marking off the size of the ark so our junior kids could go out and look at it in the service time. And that guy that was calling those turkeys was Mark Simpson. And it was turkey hunting. And he said to me in Canada, he said, I can't take this any longer on Thursday night. Kenny, you were there, weren't you? And so we've seen Mark, and we've seen his daddy, and we've seen his son, three generations, give their hearts to our Savior at one place at one time. Yeah. I'm saying God has those doors for you. If you feel something on your shoulder and you say, well, I think that's the Roman soldier that's placed the flat part of his spear on my shoulder, it might not be. It might be the hand of God that touched that soldier, that brutal soldier, that he might use him to open a door forever, for eternity, for others. Amen.